You know, I can remember 2008 like it was yesterday. Bear Stearns collapsed in the spring, the FDIC intervened on IndyMac Bank in the summer, and then the Dow fell 770 points in one day in late September. I remember calling a meeting with Lori and Alice and Chris and asking them, what are we gonna do? Clients are getting concerned, we gotta respond. And Alice said I needed to ask them how we could help. So I turned to Lori and said, is anybody scheduled for a meeting tonight? She said, yeah, Dave S. And I said, that's great, cool. So that night I asked Dave what he thought, and I'll never forget his response. You might need to be prepared for a few tomatoes. And I think I got a little defensive and said, hey, I didn't cause this bear market. And Dave paused and said, no, but I and your other clients are gonna wanna know how you're gonna respond to it and how you're gonna protect our money. Yeah, that was it. The Fireside Chat was born at that moment. bottom in the foreclosure market simply because there's such a huge inventory of homes for which the paperwork hasn't been processed yet. Prepare yourself for the tsunami and I'm reading from the article that is coming. That's what at least one financial expert is saying. Charles Brown of CB3 Financial says that instead of selling foreclosed homes, banks One of the brilliant moves that Kmart has done is to partnership with Facebook in these e-gift certificates so you can actually go on to their site. So is this another example of government mismanagement? Charles Brown is the president of CB3 Financial Group. He joins us this morning from Chicago. Good to see you, sir. We'll see the unemployment rate significantly dropping. Basically, this is the year of the consumer to get their spending in check. Can we believe that they're capable of managing anything? Well, it's sort of like handing the keys to the chicken coop to two wolves. Charles, thanks for joining us this morning on Fox and Friends. Thank you. Enjoy it. We didn't video record those first few years, but in 2010 and 2011, Fox News picked up some of my commentaries in the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg regarding the real estate collapse. That was a fun time for all of us, except for the fact that Standard & Poor's downgraded the U.S. debt in August of 2011, which caused a ton of havoc in the markets for several weeks. By 2013, I realized we had to improve the financial planning piece of what we offered since I was and still am primarily a portfolio manager. And I remember Alice and Siri came back from a trade show all excited about this software called eMoney. So we demoed the software for a few days and then I went into Lori's office and said, can we get our clients up and running on this in say two to three months? And her eyes widened as she said, uh, maybe 18 months. Right then I knew we had to find a partner. So we interviewed firms in uh, New York, Connecticut, Downers Grove, Dallas, and Cleveland. The final interview was with a firm in St. Charles. OnPath Financial was our last and best interview. We could see the strong connection, really from day one. Their belief system, their culture, client values aligned exactly with ours. Kyle, Dan, Rich, David, and now Aaron have really become the perfect partnership to work with as we invest and financially plan for the next decade of our clients' growth. You know, clients still ask me two things. How are you investing for me right now? And my answer to that's always been, well, every day we're picking the absolute best stocks we can find to meet the objective of the managed programs we offer. Now, since we became a registered investment advisor, we've never traded stock mutual funds and never will. Stock picking has served us and our clients well since we started more than a decade ago. That's what our clients deserve. And the second thing clients ask these days is, well, how long are you going to keep doing this? And my answer is still the same. As long as we can bring value and wisdom to you, our clients, we'll be doing this. I mean, Warren Buffett's 87, and he still wears a tie to work every day, and even I don't do that. Many clients out there have a salesperson who phones them every so often, but has no clue what's actually in their portfolio. 
and others work with a portfolio management firm and have to deal with voicemails and busy signals when they need something. That's just not good enough for us and the clients we serve. What's in your portfolio? If you don't know, you should. If you want to know, we can help. You know, the truth is, um, I still wake up at 0500 most every day. I scour the news, I look at the Asian market close, the European markets are about halfway done when I'm up. I look for pre-market earnings reports in the US markets and then any tidbits that might give our clients an advantage for a new buy or sell. Alice and I still have about 75% of our net worth invested in the five CB3 programs, so we literally and figuratively stand beside our clients. And you know, I just love this night in January. Right here, right now, when the lights go down, I step up to the podium and talk about last year, this coming year, and what we might all expect. There's simply no place I'd rather be. And nobody I'd rather be with than this group of friends who blessed us with their support for the last decade. Yeah, that's it. There we have it. Hard to believe it's been that long for those of you that have been with us that long. But it's been a fun ride. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. And here we start on the next 10 years. Um, here tonight, obviously, Dan will join me at the uh, question and answer section like he's been doing the last uh, several times here. Our topics are similar. The first one is similar anyway to what we've done in the past. The world and markets in 2018. The Trump effect. One year review. Last time I stood here, we were talking about what could be. Well, now we have a year's worth of data to figure that out. Tax reform and your money, the biggest single piece of tax legislation in 31 years, has just been passed. So let's dig right in. <clears throat> so this is the chart that was in the video that you just saw. Um, the low of the market down here, let's see if my red dot's working, 676.53, March 9, 2009. Wow. Wow, nine years ago, this coming March, a lot has happened since then. A lot has happened. So looking at 2017 as a whole, earnings are expected to be up about 9.5%, sales up 6.2 compared to 2016, just 1% and 2.5. So a huge improvement in overall productivity of American corporations. Every major sector is expected to report earnings growth for 2017 now you might say, well, the year's finished, but we don't get the earnings reports until March or when everybody's done. And that's expected to be repeated in 2018 as the earnings growth accelerates, okay? My very first questionnaire for you guys, when you look at that chart, what do you see? So first of all, the numbers are not that really important. On the left-hand side are the years. We're looking for the anomaly. It's in the colors. I'm hearing somebody say something. All green on the bottom. That would mean that every single month and November and December of last year all finished positive in the Wilshire 5000. The current president has not seen since he was elected a down month in the market. This has never happened, certainly, in, since they started keeping records. Doesn't mean that that's, you know, past performance is no guarantee of future performance, right? But that's the, that's the numbers. That's how it works out. So the current S&P 500 sector weighting is as follows, and why is this important? There are 11 sectors. My editorial on this is there really should be 10. Telecom and utility should be combined, and that may happen, get us back to 10 sectors. We expanded from 10 to 11 when they added real estate, which made sense. But technology at 24, financials and healthcare, add those two together, and they're just a little bit bigger than technology. This country's future is built on technology, it's built on innovation. You hear about the FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Google, which is Alphabet. Um, that's, that's where the development is. So when we see um, hemorrhaging or any concerns in these sectors up here, it's way more important than what's happening down here. And I've been introducing that with the relative rotation graphs, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but we're following sector and sector growth. That your allocation to the correct sectors is more important than any single thing, really, as an investor, other than over-leveraging. So breaking down fourth quarter earnings per share growth estimated by sector. Again, it's estimated because we don't have everything in until March. Look at this number right here. 
Okay, why is energy so high? Because finally, the energy sector is gaining some traction. Okay, materials, these are building materials that are going into construction. This has also been a strong sector. Technology has had a tremendous year looking backwards, but going forward probably will not perform as well. But these three sectors are where we have been mostly concentrated this year, certainly in our growth programs. The fourth quarter of 2017 marks the sixth consecutive quarter of earnings per share growth. That's a pretty amazing number. It doesn't go back 50 years, but it's still pretty amazing considering the tepid economy and the collapse of energy and commodities just a few years ago. I mean, oil went from trading at 140 in 2013 to almost a two handle, but certainly in the, th in the 30 handle for quite some time. So that recovery in energy is one of the guiding points to 2018 success. We're on track for the best annual earnings per share growth since 2011. It's a great number. When earnings per share is growing, that means your stocks are becoming more valuable. That means they're going up in price. This is a Goldman Sachs uh, prediction into the future, and we're pretty much playing all this out. I actually pulled this from a year ago to see if it was going to play out accurately, and it is. Okay. Earnings sales growth. So earnings per share is different than sales, but you still want to have strong sales. So energy, financials, why would you suppose financials is so high? Energy is high because it's, again, a recovering sector. But financials, what are the two reasons? Anybody? We like this to be interactive. You remember that, right? So, okay, so what do financials have? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, everybody knows the market's coming about. They want to get involved. That's fair. That's fair. We have a reduction in regulation. We're going to be talking a lot about regulation tonight. Who is the most regulated of all the sectors? The financials. Okay. And the second reason, interest rates are starting to creep up. Very, very measured, thanks to the Federal Reserve, whatever you think of them. But that's why you're seeing expected sales growth in these double-digit numbers. Okay. So valuations, it's really important what the market perceives a valuation to be. So currently, uh, I've used the word frothy. I'm not quite sure I believe that, but I put that in there because many people are saying that. I, did, I didn't want you to think I was looking at the market with rose-colored glasses. A 20.7 adjusted earnings versus 18.6 if you look forward, and that's because of value. So right now, this cup in my hand has maybe a value of three or four cents. Would you agree with me that's not overpriced at that? It's just a plain old cup with water. Okay, if this same cup of water was by the side of a road in, or in one of those little tables at a marathon and a runner wanted it and they had to pay for it and it was $4, you probably wouldn't think that was overpriced. Same commodity, different situation. If this same cup of water was in the Mojave Desert and you hadn't had anything to drink for half a day, you'd probably pay anything you had to pay to get this same cup of water. So the point I'm making here is that we don't really know what the market is worth right now because we don't understand the full impact of the tax reform law which has been put in place and is the biggest change in 31 years. We'll talk more about this later on. So going forward, earnings will benefit from this Tax Cut Jobs Act. I keep calling it Act. It is law now which will permanently lower the corporate tax rate from 21 to 35. Although I'll touch on this a lot more in the third module, that change, 221 from 35, is an unbelievable change. And you're already starting to see, and I'm going to have multiple slides later on, on just what American business is doing to respond to that change. We were one of the highest taxed corporate environments in the world. We're now one of the lowest. Real estate is looking like 2005 all over again. So in my course of work, I talk to a lot of people, and you guys probably know that, that have known me for 10 years or more. And so I have around the country now real estate people, and I want to know how things are going because you can't always use Chicago as a metric. So this is South Florida. I've got another one in San Diego, Arizona, and I call them, and then I do little video clips to let people know what's going on. This particular guy, Patrick Strakuzzi, told me that he had a $7 million week. Seven, I said, you mean, you mean your firm, right? Because there's 16 of you. He said, no, that's just me. And I said, are you making 5% on that? He said, no, we can't get that for the kind of prices we're, we're selling in South Florida. It's more like four to four and a half. I said, that's 300 grand for a week. He said, that's what we're seeing. So I said, well, what's going to be the difference between 
This in 2005 and six, he said, well, the mortgage lending environment is way different now than it was then. So I just thought this was something really interesting. I just want to play this little clip for you, okay? Fundamental influences, the Trump construction boom is here and now. So says Patrick Stracuzzi of the Stracuzzi real estate team in Martin County, Florida. Patrick tells me that there is significant new construction in 15 to 20 unit two-bed, two-bath apartment buildings that are being built as spec or speculation rentals. Older commercial properties and dwellings are being bulldozed as sort of a teardown frenzy that's taking place in Martin, Indian River, and Palm Beach counties. These are the counties just north of Miami. And who's buying? Well, it's about 50-50. Half are Floridians buying in their home state, and half are from California, New York, New Jersey, and other high-tax states. You guys remember last week when I said, if you don't think you're going to benefit from tax reform law, then just move to a low tax state? Well, quite a few people are doing just that. See all these photos behind me? Patrick Stracuzzi tells me that all this new construction was started roughly about the same time, right after the Donald Trump inauguration. Patrick ought to know his firm is the largest real estate broker in Martin County, Florida, and the 24th largest area in the United States. Here's my take on the fundamental implications for our investments. Our stocks increase in value as our holdings increase in value. Real estate last peaked in the U.S. in a bubble in 2006. This new resurgence in South Florida, boosted by Donald Trump's election as president, is an indication to me that real estate, both commercial and residential, is back on track and will be a vital component in the current GDP growth of the U.S. economy and that will help our portfolios. First thing I want to say is that it was Patrick Sarkozy saying it's the Donald Trump building spree. I didn't make that comment, but he said that he just noticed so many construction sites that were going up about the same time and it was before the tax reform was even close to being in place. One of the reasons I pay attention to real estate, especially in the South, is those tend to be leading markets. You would probably not consider Chicago to be a leading indicator for real estate development, right? And there are many reasons for that, but South Florida and Arizona and Texas, and to some extent Las Vegas and Nevada are. So that's, uh, to me, a very big positive, way away from our area that some other people out there are putting millions and millions of dollars in. Patrick said he had a buyer that came in and said, well, I can do cash up to three million. After that, I have to finance. <laughs> And these are coming in from, from out of state, some of them from this state, which we'll talk about in a little bit later. So the regulatory environment, we're going to get into more of this in the second module, but how has this changed so much from 2016? Well, in 1960, there were 20,000 pages of federal regulations, which is about this high, I suppose, if you stack it up. By the end of 2016, there were 185,000. Six foot three, whoever in here is six foot three, Greg? Stack it up, 185,000 pages of regulation, and that is getting overhauled. This administration has canceled or delayed over 1,500 planned regulatory actions, more than any previous president by far. For us as investors, that's a good thing. I don't want to make a social commentary or political commentary on the environment or anything. That's just not what I'm doing for you. But on an economic basis, it's helpful to us. The president's simple message for agency heads is slash even more red tape in 2018, and after that, I don't know if there'll be any more left to do. That's kind of a flippant Trump remark for you. One stat to remember, the administration promised to cut two regulations for each one added. You may have heard that. In reality, they cut 22 for every one added, according to their documentation. So why it matters. Reductions in regulation are happening now, this expert said. That's why the markets are exuberant. Regulation and business are antonyms. They do not work well together. A reduction in regulations, and I understand their environmental concerns and political concerns, but from a business point of view, we want to see businesses be free to build and develop. All right, from a technical point of view, how many of you guys have been showing you these for about a year? Anybody? Raise hands. Do you know what you're looking at? Relative rotation graph? Anybody? Okay, good. So I want to spend just a few minutes on this and because this is important in how we select stocks for you. This is a relative rotation graph. Right here in the center, in this case, is the World Stock Index benchmark, meaning all the world indices are globbed into one index, they're averaged, and they're right here in the middle. So 
it would stand to reason that it stock, or not stocks, but indices over here are outperforming the world averages. Down here, they're weakening. They're still better, but they're weakening. Here, they're lagging. Red is not good, just like most times it's used in life. And this quadrant is when they're moving out of lagging, and this is called improving. So I always want to know where the U.S. is in this. Are there other places in the world where we need to be investing, which we could do through exchange-traded funds or ADRs? Um, American Depository Reserves, or is the U.S. really the strongest? So I'm going to get rid of all of the other countries and just zoom in on the U.S. This is exciting to me. The S&P 500 has just entered, three days ago, the leading quadrant. You might be saying, well, but we're already at market highs, okay? But a lot of countries around the world are at market highs. We want to be even better than that. We want to be better than the countries that are over in here. Now, the S&P is joining the Dow and the NASDAQ, the four major indices. I realize there are five, but that's because I show the NASDAQ, both the large index and the small index. The concern that I have is that the small caps are not really participating. You can't see the line too well, but they're trying to enter the leading, and they're not quite yet. So um, we have a small cap program that uh, had a good year last year, had a really good year the year before. Um, and it's, it's integral to what we do, but small caps are a little fi finicky sometimes. So we're watching this very carefully. There is no way to have the next major leg of a bull market without small cap participation. So we'll see how that develops. So key takeaways from the 2017 review and the 2018 forecast. I believe that investors are underrating the economic tailwind of reflationary policies. You might say when you see that inflationary word, that's a bad thing. I don't know how many of you ever go out to Zillow or a similar service and just see how your house is doing. You know what you paid for it and just see what Zillow says it's worth today. We signed up for a, a monthly email and we've been real pleased to see that our, our, our place in Glen Ellen um, has gone up about 9% since we bought it, which wasn't that long ago. So some inflation is good. It would be great if our homes inflated, but gasoline prices didn't and medical expenses didn't, but you can't pick and choose like that. So. We expect above trend growth in the US and Europe in 2018. Uh, this economic confidence, which has remained largely absent, this is the most unloved bull market in history in my assessment, has finally emerged. I don't mean it's full throttle. I mean it's just finally emerging, whether it's due to politics or other reasons. Certainly, the EPS that I showed you earlier uh, is a good reason. But certainly politics is part of that and will spur greater risk taking in equity markets. And I think that's what you're seeing with the S&P pushing into the leading quadrant on the previous slide. Another key takeaway, after suffering through the worst decade for stocks in history, thank you all for hanging in there from 2000 to 2010. We are now getting near the end of this decade. Well, in my opinion, the MHO is in my humble opinion, the fundamentals underpinning stocks are more positive for investors than they're currently believing. I don't think people have fully priced in what this tax reform is gonna do. I just don't think it is. I just don't think they have, and I think that's a positive for us. I still think this is the direction we're going. Now, I'm not standing up here jumping up and down. I don't have rose-colored glasses, but this is just my unemotional academic assessment. We have more to run here. The US bull market has more legs. It is roaring. We had a little bit of a pullback on Tuesday, and then look at yesterday. The money just rushes back into the market. When that stops happening, I'll be commenting on it. The great rotation has probably barely begun. The great rotation is generally acknowledged to be when large institutions sell to retail investors, i.e. weaker hands. This entire bull market, for the most part, has been institutionally driven meaning that mom and pop investors still are not going in, and that's the animal spirits I talk about. What are animal spirits, and how do you know we're entering that phase? When you get in a cab in Chicago and ask how they're doing, and they say, well, I'm doing okay, but I'm going to quit and become a day trader in about a month. I've got 10 grand saved up, and I think I can make a living off that. That's animal spirits. I'm not hearing anybody say that yet. So, all right, here's my summary. The U.S. dollar will continue to weaken. Actually, a year ago, I stood here. The U.S. dollar, I thought, was going to go through 100, 105, stay above there. Didn't happen. So in the U.S. dollar index, the dollar is weaker now than it has been in some time. The euro is back in the 128 range. But honestly, 
we have a current president who does not care about having a weak dollar. It's an unusual juxtaposition of logic, but I can't argue with the success of that. The risk challenging U.S. and global economy will likely not get derailed in the first half of 18. I'll be back here in August and we'll see what happened, but I don't see any way to derail this in the first half. The Trump era will continue to provoke uncertainty in ways we have never before experienced. I think we can all agree to that. <laughs> um, no question. So, uh, a year ago, I laid out what I thought could happen during President Trump's, President Trump's first year. And now I'm going to show you what I think has happened. I, I have to continue to put this disclaimer in here. It's, it's impossible to talk about achievements with an administration and a Congress without sounding somewhat political. But I'm not going to focus on those. I'm going to focus on the economic benefits that have happened. And these are the top ten that I see. So here are the quotes. This is what we're working with as far as the divide in our society. 2017 was incredible, life-changing, better for all of us. Trump will make America great again. That's what the deplorables are saying. You all know what the deplorables are, right? 2017 was horrible, debilitating, embarrassing, scathing, diplomatic disaster. Trump is a total embarrassment. That's the far left. There doesn't seem to be much middle. But I'm trying to be in the middle and saying, well, it was more dramatic than I expected. But here are what I think are the top ten achievements and therefore what can benefit us as investors. Number 10, removing net neutrality. This may not seem like a big deal, but this was a regulatory issue that was clamping a pretty large industry, telco, internet providers. The benefit to us, less regulations almost always translates into a stronger and more stimulative business environment. That's good for us because it lowers the overhead and the hurdles, I should say, for business success. At number nine, recognizing Jerusalem as the Israeli capital. Now, you must be saying, nope, that's political, Charlie. But it's not. It's not. Despite the pressure to preserve the status quo, and I will tell you that President Trump had an advantage that President Obama didn't have, who promised to move the, amb the uh, embassy, and President Bush didn't have. Okay, what's his advantage? We'll get to that. Okay, why is this important to us? Why is this an economic benefit? This move alerts our Arab energy competitors that we are not the least bit concerned about any retaliation from them. You saw the picture from the first fireside chat in 2008. Never in my life at that meeting did I think I would be standing here saying, we are not only energy independent, we are going to be energy dominant. And OPEC will be kowtowing to us. We're not quite there yet, but this move, while it sounds like a political move, is an economic statement that the U.S. is here. The U.S. has arrived as an energy producer. I know I have oil people in the audience. I don't know if they agree with that. You can let me know. Number eight, killing ISIS. Uh, I stole that from Bill O'Reilly, so <laughs> he's doing all the killing books, right? Again, could sound like a political statement, but the reality is when people aren't getting shot up and pictures of heads getting chopped off in the news, it makes for a more stable environment. Since, and, and you may have a different number than I have, but I believe that ISIS's landscape, their territory, has been reduced 90 to 95 percent in the first year. What that has done is take them out of the news and let us as investors not have to worry about when the next execution, fly into a building, whatever, and, and of course it could, could still happen. But we're not seeing this in the news on a daily basis. Therefore, the fear level has been reduced. And that's one reason why the fear index, the VIX, has been at all-time lows this year. At number seven, trade agreements. Trump put the world on notice that America will no longer be exploited at the bargaining table. Exited TP TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, renegotiating NAFTA. Why are these so important? It's difficult to imagine a balanced trade deficit. I don't know that any of us is old enough in this room that remembers when we had a balanced trade deficit. What this does is strengthens us at the bargaining table, and here's why. I'm going to name five countries, and I want you guys to speak out as to which of these countries is the least dependent on exports. Which of these five countries is the least dependent on exports? China, Japan, 
the United States, South Korea, Norway. Anybody? U.S. is the correct answer. The U.S. is the correct answer. What percentage? About 34% of our GDP is exports, which is not fair. And that's where Trump stands up and says, this isn't going to exist. But what that means is it gives us power. So we can be frustrated by that small amount of exports, but we don't need it because we are a self-provisional economy, minus the 34%, unlike the other nations. So with this mindset, this just tells me that it gives U.S. corporations a leg up, which they didn't have. Neil Gorsuch, com uh, confirmation, Supreme Court justice, pretty straightforward. The, the court goes back to its regulatory rejection mindset that it had under the Scalia court. Yes, I know that John Roberts is the ch chief justice, but Scalia wrote everything and really was the conversation piece. Neil Gorsuch has returned just to where we were. I don't think it's changed the fabric of the court, but it's at least gotten us away from the uncertainty. Number five. President Trump and Senate con confirmed 12 federal appeals court justices. President Obama did 11, but this is the greatest number of any president. Okay? Why is this important? Same thing. Conservative justices are usually more business friendly. There's less willingness to uphold regulations that were made through executive order in previous administrations. Hot topic. Political, I understand that, but less regulations is better for business, and that's what we in this room want to see. Number four, rollback of regulations. Touched on this earlier, more of it here. Cut regulations, the 22 to 1 that I mentioned. Repealed the Clean Power Plan. Uh, drilling in the Arctic, drilling in Mexico, Gulf of Mexico, pardon me. Keystone Pipeline, gosh, that was in the news. Not hearing it in the news anymore, are you? Okay, this is 12 months. This is 12 months this has happened. Expected benefit, less regulations. I know you've seen it multiple times. But lowering the hurdle for business success, that's what you want to see for American business. And you're going to see at the end of the presentation just how many have responded to this. Number three, cutting government waste. Trump directed every federal agency to determine where money's being wasted and how services can be improved. Shrinking payrolls and massive massive cuts at the State Department, and I'm especially close to this because my son-in-law works there and I was concerned for his job. But it was all the seventh floor or whatever floor when Rex Tillerson walked in and said, you know what, this whole floor, we don't need you, see you. This is early, this is February of last year. What's the benefit? Well, less government waste means less growth. This is one area where you don't want growth. Growth is good, not in debt, okay? Reducing our country's debt should be a confidence boost to both businesses and consumers. At some point, when the national debt goes from 14 to 15 trillion, and now it's only taking four or five months to add another, another trillion, that begins to dull the senses to a long-term business plan where they're going, you know, we gotta factor this in. We, we wanna remove that as a factor. And if you start seeing the national debt dropping by even a trillion a year, which is doable, again, it's a psychological boost to corporations. Number two, the economy. Now by this I mean the real economy as opposed to just asset prices. We know that stocks have gone up, but it's more than that. Workers' productivity ramped 3% in the third quarter, far above the scant 1.2 average of the last eight years. That means if a worker is able to produce this many widgets in this quarter, this quarter he can produce, he or she, 1.2, well that's now gone to three. Okay, so figure that out over four quarters a year and see what productivity is like. That's a huge improvement. Truck orders surging, manufacturing jobs higher, okay? Highest gains in 15 years according to ADP, which has pretty good data. And the number, well, sorry, increasing GDP obviously creates more jobs, higher wages. Global strength as we primarily are an internal consumption economy. I mentioned this just earlier. You guys know the number now. 34% of our entire economy depends on exports. We want more. We don't want to be dependent on them because those other nations when we stop buying, their heart starts beating a lot faster. And number one, as you would expect, the tax reform law. Congress capped off 2017 with its first major legislative victory. Reducing that corporate tax rate from 35 to 21 is huge. If that's all it did, it would be absolutely landmark. But it does much more than that, and we'll talk about that in the next section. But just that one change from the corporate tax rate of 35 down to 21 repatriating that money from overseas and bringing it back here, that alone makes it worth it. 
Now, we'll get into that in just a second. I have something for you that I'm pretty sure you haven't seen because I have a source in Washington that told me about something that just happened. How can they be laughing already? <laughs> you know that these two men are sparring on Twitter all the time, right? Okay? And you think they can't stand each other. But fortunately, they both have people working for them and saying, you know, if you guys could just do one little thing, to give a little confidence to world peace. Just one little thing. Can you get together and do that? It took months. But my source on the inside in Washington reported to me that there was a Skype session. They have pictures from it. I think before anybody else in the world knows about this, you guys are going to know. The very first Donald Trump, Kim Jong-un trade deal. You ready? <laughs> I was flabbergasted when they sent me this. Just flabbergasted. But I thought, you know what? If they're willing to do that, then I'm going to show up and keep you guys encouraged because that's giving up one for the giver, don't you think? <laughs> All right. It's really almost impossible to calculate the breadth of effect that a Donald Trump presidency is going to have. It has been far more erratic, crazy, successful, controversial, acidic. Uh, there's really, you can just pretty much throw any adjective in there. When I stood up here last year, I compared it to Ronald Reagan and said, no, that doesn't work. I compared it to John F. Kennedy and said, that really doesn't work either. Although there are components of John F. Kennedy, almost more than Reagan. And then I compared it to Franklin Roosevelt. And that didn't work because Trump is much more of a businessman than either him or his cousin, Teddy Roosevelt. I still believe that when we look back on this, that this comparison is probably appropriate. We know how this ended. And I'm not making a projection. I didn't last year, but we are... We are in for the ride of our lives in 2018 based on what I'm going to show you in the last module, and that's the Tax Reform Act, okay? Um, this is about as ugly a negotiating process as I've seen in Washington until the next one comes along, which will be even uglier. <laughs> tax reform, let's start at the beginning. Why do we need to reform taxing? Because when a law goes into existence in 1986, and another administration comes along and just tacks a little bit on, pulls a little bit off. They get enough votes to do that or tax a little bit on. It's called feature creep in software lingo. Features creep on and becomes tougher for the processor to handle it. So you have to put out new hardware. So what's happened in 31 years is the code has gotten cumbersome. But you guys always do your taxes on the back of an envelope, right? No, of course not. So that's why it was necessary at the personal level. At the business level, you've seen just hammered in now, if you didn't know, at 35%, what company from South Korea, China, Japan, or Norway for that matter, wants to come here and open their doors? At 21, that's going to be much more attractive. This is known as the Tax Cuts and Job Act. It is law now, but just note that there is this component of jobs. We're actually not going to even talk about that tonight because there's so much it would take a whole session. But I want to hone in on this and why this is so important. So note, we will cover this probably in the summer when we have a little more history on how this law, this monumental law, is developing. <coughs> tax cuts and jobs. Interestingly, U.S. Um, companies have taken their own initiatives as far as enacting this. We'll get to that in just a few slides. Notice, despite what you're hearing in the media, that this tax reform affects all taxpayers. It's not just the rich. It's not just the 1%. It affects all taxpayers. It really has to. Because if you're lowering the corporate tax rate, and even though the number of tax brackets stayed the same, which I thought was a travesty, but we were dealing with Congress, all of those rates are lower. 
When the IRS published this one week ago today, it became reality. It wasn't just an act. It was law, and it was going to happen on February 1st for payrolls February 1st. And here's what it looks like. This is what the income tax rate was in 2017. Here's what it is, 2018 to 2025. You might say, why is it expiring in 2025? This is my opinion. It's not something Republicans are talking about. They couldn't get it done permanently because of um, debt restrictions when you put a deal in. I also believe that they thought if we get voted out of power, we definitely want the business ones to be permanent. If we come back into power in the next seven years, we can go back and address making those personal uh, lower tax rates permanent. But they didn't want the business tax rates to be movable at, in, in any way. So let's look at the highlights. It doubles the standard deduction. That's the, the number one deduction you have. So instead of six, it's 12 for a single person. Instead of 12, it's 24. It's doubling it, roughly doubling. That's a big deal. If you have a high deduction as a, as a joint filer, you may not need to use a Schedule A. If you don't need to use a Schedule A, it may be simpler. I still don't believe it's on the back of an envelope, but it still certainly may be simpler. That's an improvement. Eliminates personal exemptions. So this can be a problem if you live in a high tax state and you have a lot of kids. This is gone now. So as a result, families living in high state income tax, like Illinois with seven kids, it's going to actually cost you more. Now again, they knew that they could not structure a, a bill, which became law, that's going to benefit every single family. But this is a message to high state income tax entities. Now there are those that suggest that most of those states are blue states. And there are people that suggest that President Trump wanted this in so that he could just sort of do a gotcha to his political rivals. Now I for one can't imagine President Trump doing anything like that. <laughs> but nonetheless, <laughs> It does keep the deductions for charitable contributions, retirement savings, and student loan interest. I think this one's kind of comical because nobody's paying back student loans anyway, which is why there's so many in default. That's a whole other issue. We've talked about that before in this room. Salt. This is not what you put down on the streets. State and local taxes. This is a very big deal now. Taxpayers can deduct in the new law up to $10,000 in state and local taxes, but they must choose between property taxes and income or even sales taxes. I started to say this will harm, but really it's going to devastate taxpayers in high tax states like New York, California, and Illinois. Just coincidentally, blue states. So the number one question we should be saying, how is this going to affect us in Chicagoland? Is this going to affect our economy? This point was proven to me <coughs> when, do you remember we had like a 60 degree day this month? We've had mostly single digits, but then it just went crazy, like 58, whatever. So I was out, it was raining. I was parked at an intersection, had my windshield wipers going, long, long red light, long, long red light. And these vans just kept going by me. And I kept thinking, so what's the relevance of this? <laughs> this is just one traffic light, it's just one traffic light. I have a feeling this is happening in California, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and they're going to Florida, Texas, Tennessee, even Idaho. It's not all south, but a low tax environment. Again, I'm sure our president didn't do that on, pos in, on purpose to harm these states, but as Illinoisans, we have to find a way to deal with this. So it limits the deduction on mortgage interest to the first $750,000 of a loan. For most of us, that's not going to be a problem, even in Illinois, unless you're in downtown Chicago, I suppose. Interest on home equity lines, HELOCs, no longer deducted. Now, if you have a HELOC, you're fine, you're grandfathered. But the number of new HELOCs that are going to be open, not going to happen. So you say, well, then I'll just refi the whole thing. Okay, but you got a mortgage at three and a quarter, and now your refi is at four. This is one of the concerns I've got for the real estate market, again, in high-tax states. Why is Patrick Stacuzzi's video so remarkable? Because Floridians don't deal with that. They don't deal with that. 
Current mortgage holders aren't affected, I just said that. Nationwide, the impact of the limit on mortgage deductions seems pretty minimal, except that in New York, well, sorry, next slide, um, puts the spotlight on areas of the country like New York where 64% of new mortgages are above 750, and in San Francisco, 58%. And now you know why Nancy Pelosi is so upset. Not quite so bad here in Illinois, but again, the blue state blues for mortgage deduction. The act doubles the estate tax exemption. So for those of you that didn't want to pay any estate tax and you've been waiting to die, like just kind of waiting to kick off, this is a really good time. Because <laughs> you can have $22 million. Kyle and Dan, they got all your estate planning going. They've just been waiting for this. So if you just tired of life, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's truth. That's, that's an estate issue. Again, that's why, the, that's why they're here. Um, okay, so that helps the top 1% of the population, which pays $17 billion in taxes. It's kind of amazing. So after this, the exemption reverts to pre-levels back in 20, or ahead in 2026. You're going to see this throughout this tax reform law, that on the consumer side, there's a, a sundown for many of these provisions. I frankly think that they will continue on much past this, but they, they only had the energy and the time. Again, remember this, this vote got done when Alabama flipped their uh, Jeff Sessions seat. You know, it was 52-48, it went to 51-49. They barely got this done. So I don't see this as a big issue as I've, I've seen some people um, be concerned about. It keeps the alternative minimum tax. It increases the exemption from 54 to 70 on, for singles and 84 to 100. What that means is it's a higher threshold before AMT kicks in. That's generally a good thing, but they didn't get rid of it overall. It does phase out at a half a million dollars in income. And it too sunsets in 2026, which I don't expect to see. It does allow parents to use 529. For those of you that have 529s, you can use it for tuition at private and religious. K-12 schools can also use it for homeschooling. So they expanded on that. Now, the minority party had a motion to include household pets for 529s. That was voted down. So, Okay. The heck lowers the maximum corporate weight. We've talked about this. Lowest, guys, just to give you perspective, 1939 was the last time that the corporate tax rate was this low. The United States had one of the highest tax rates and now the many corporations, I, I just can't mention all the benefits of the, the corporate side because you're consumers and that's really what you wanna hear. What I can do though is show you, and I'm just gonna flip through these and I'm gonna watch you. When you start yawning or you're looking at your watch because you're just tired of seeing this, President Trump has said, you're gonna see so much winning you're gonna get sick of it. So. If you guys get sick of this, I'll, I'll stop, all right? American Airlines, $1,000 bonuses, 130,000 people. AT&T, $1,000 bonuses, 200,000 employees. Do the math on that. Bank of America, one-time bonus of 1,000 uh, if you make less than 150 a year. Financial, First Financial Northwest, $1,000 bonuses. Comcast, holiday bonuses, 100,000 employees. We're, we, have, we own the stock in uh, one of our portfolios. Special one-time cash bonus of 1,000. Fiat, one-time $2,000 bonus. And here's the biggie. The company also said it's moving production of their Ram truck from Mexico to Warren, uh, Michigan. Is that awesome or what? You can believe those folks in Michigan and Detroit, which filed for bankruptcy, are glad to see that. Fifth third. Raise the minimum wage to 15 for all employees. One-time bonus for more than 13,000. Wells Fargo, minimum, minimum wage uh, increase as well. Southwest Airlines, $1,000 bonuses. JetBlue, $1,000 to 21,000 all crew members. Walmart, one-time bonus up to $1,000 and increase the minimum wage. Question, is this not just a political cover for these corporations? for the phenomenal bonuses that they're going to be giving to senior executives because the corporations are so flush with cash. And they can now politically point and say, oh, look at what we've done for average Joe. Sure. Meanwhile, we're padding the living daylights out of the senior officers. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any corroboration on what they're doing with the senior officers. I don't no, have they're any. they're not putting it out, but well, you know. Well, I, you know. <laughs> Dave, I, I, could be. I, I know you have questions for me later on. I know you have questions for me. 
Um, I'm almost done. In fact, I'll skip because I'm, I'm kind of sensing you guys have seen enough here. I want to mention the latest two, though. Um, sorry, there's a ton of these here. This is it. This is just today. 14 utilities are cutting rates, citing benefits of the Trump tax reform. That's, that's straight from their verbiage. And here's the biggie. This is 10 hours ago. 10 hours ago, Donald Trump phones Tim Cook and says, I heard you're going you're gonna to invest $350 million in your local facilities. He said, you, you got that totally wrong. You mean $350 billion. This is the biggest single investment. It's a third of a trillion dollars. A third of a trillion dollars. Here's the headline from a few hours ago. 20,000 new jobs in LA alone, or in Orange County. I don't know if this, Dave, is political posturing. I do know that Tim Cook and Donald Trump think nothing of each other. Um, at least that's what it looked like when they met on that advisory council back in <laughs> January of last year. But I don't see that there's any downside to this for the US economy. So that's tax reform. And remember down here is little blotches because it's also the jobs law. And we'll cover that next time I see you and we've seen a little bit more information. We just really value each and every one of you and the trust you've placed in us. The teamwork, I hope, is working for you guys. We're always here for you. Hope you always remember that at our partnership, we don't just manage your assets. We become one of them. Thank you.